Good morning, happy Thursday, and welcome to another special edition of Adam versus the Man. Now, as for our immediate circumstances, you might notice that we're not in our regular studio. In fact, we're not in any studio. We are in my car because this morning I got to drop off my princess, my little princess, Marilyn, uh, uh, my my wife's adopted puppy who uh, needs to go in and get her shots and get fixed this morning. And I had to drop her off early. So I woke up early from our place near Ash Fork, Juniper Wood, and drove into Chino Valley. And it didn't really make sense logistically. I wouldn't have any time to prep anyway, driving home to the studio and back here to pick her up and for all the other things we've got going on today. So thanks for bearing with us for this fun little special edition featuring more rants and callers than usual so if you want to call in in the first hour right now comment jim freedom is putting the link to the stream yard super easy way to join us you can join excuse me with or without video just voice is fine we'll be happy to have you join us this morning i think our biggest audience still with this production is the audio version of the podcast and i'm, I'm very grateful for everybody who lets me live in your head for two hours a day so Today, if you want to call in, we would greatly appreciate it. The link is probably, as we speak, already being into, entered by Comment Jim Freedom. And uh, we've got CJ joining us from South Dakota. This is, uh, we, and most importantly, we've got a really great guest today. And it doesn't matter that I'm coming to you from my car, because I'm not going to be on screen very much. I'm really just happy to lend my platform to our guest, Lynn Ulbricht. And Lynn Ulbricht is... Uh, Ross Ulbricht's mother, who has done an amazing job. And I say this as an activist who's gone to jail and, and had my, my mom back me up. My family backed me up. When I went to jail for four months, uh, they, they were there. They were absolutely there for me. But it was a, it was a extremely low-risk situation compared to that of Ross Ulbricht, who was serving two concurrent life sentences for being the creator of the Silk Road. And his mother, Lynn Ulbricht, has, as far as I can tell, earned the nickname I've tried to give her that doesn't seem to have stuck, the patron saint of activist mothers. And this guy you see on screen right here, Ross, he is extremely lucky to have Lynn, his mother, as his voice, as his advocate, and cheerleader and, and defender in many ways. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got an interesting history. I'm going to save that for when I introduce her properly. Uh, and I've got my own personal backstory with the Silk Road that I haven't told for a while. So we're going to get our probos out of the way right here. Cigarfederation.com, promo code ADAM10, ADAM10, all caps, get you 10% off. As always, tomorrow we will be doing... Uh, a Friday show, catching up on the headlines, since we are going to be way behind after today. Uh, but there's or, today we are going to cover, don't worry, we'll cover the essential ones. There are a few need-to-know headlines today, but there, it's all political bullshit. Nobody really cares. I, 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 all right, first side rant. Fuck the news. Really, fuck the news. Right? Well, why, why, do we, why do we do this? Why have we let it come to this? It is so, it is, like, even the Drudge Report, fuck Matt Drudge right right now. What he's, I don't want to say against him first. I don't want to sound too negative. But really, the kind of, kind of crap that passes for news today, it's embarrassing. And it's not just, a, you know, I, I don't want to blame the victims of, of the consumers who have been lied to and propagandized and, and, and conditioned and so on and so forth and led to, to, fall for all of this nonsense designed to manipulate us. Uh, but in a sense, yeah, <clears throat> it really is our responsibility as consumers of news to not promote this crap, to not, and, and, and please, like, and I, 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 this is a rant. I'm like, I'm ranting to the Adam versus the man audience. You're the last people who need to hear this because we give you the news translated into real talk translated from propaganda to the agenda behind it, translated from the lies to the truth to the best of our abilities. But for what 
the American people for what, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm falling for some of the illusion myself here. Maybe people aren't really reading or and what, but that you can't. Yeah. And, and yeah, a lot of the numbers, of course. Yeah. It's like when the police say, when they, well, we got accused of wrongdoing. So we, we investigated ourselves and, and cleared ourselves of any wrongdoing. Well, it's like when the news media says, look how many people are watching cable news every night. Look how many people are reading our website. Can't believe that shit. Nothing on the internet is real. I'm not even real. What do you mean? Look at the numbers. You put enough of the pieces together and you go, I might not know the entire truth, but I know that a lot of this is bullshit. And I have to sit here for two hours a day, five days a week, and pretend like I know what's going on. Well, I am... I hope I am I am at least honored by everybody who supports the show, who makes this possible to have the privilege of being that guy serving this function, to be looking at the world through, at very least, an honest lens, a lens of my integrity, a lens of a proper understanding that there is a hidden agenda behind most of the bullshit that they are trying to sell us and an informed position. I hope relatively informed doing my best with my team behind me to make sure that by watching this show, you have a better understanding of what's going on in the world. So part of what we're going to do today, we're going to take some calls in the first hour. We're going to talk to Lynn Ulbricht for the second hour of the show. But uh, speaking of thanking people, especially everybody who supports the show via Patreon, as as CJ just had pulled up on screen there with AdamVersusTheMan.com. There it is. You can go directly to Patreon.com slash AdamVersusTheMan and give us us money. Give us, of course, yeah, give us money. We're We're all not just volunteers right now in the core team, but we are donating and contributing our time because not only do we believe in the future of this business and that the, the, the market will improve, that eventually just you show people a better product that the market will respond. But also because we believe as libertarians that what we are doing, even in producing a podcast like this, is in our own way standing up to the greatest injustices of the world which is not the fact that not enough people own Adam versus the man merchandise, which is also a grave injustice that CJ is highlighting here by putting it on your screen. Also available from Adam versus the man.com slash store. This great, great shop that CJ has put together every item that you could possibly imagine with our logo and stuff on it. Most exciting for me is the stuff with, uh, the Garden of Freedom, to see Gardenia merchandise, that just uh, warms my heart with the Gardenia Sovereignty Project. So also, make the, gee, CJ's just leading the show for me today. This is making my job really easy. I love it. MakeThemDebate.com is a new website that we're also promoting. Had our first uh, debate with Dario Rahim last week. It was so much fun. I had kittens on my side, so I won the debate. That's right. We have kittens at the Garden of Freedom. Uh, but anyway, before we move on to that, check out MakeThemDebate.com. If you want to find my profile, you can put in my name. It's very easy to find. Or go to slash debater slash Adam Kokesh. And you can see there are a number of de- debates up there that have been put together thanks to my debate manager, Mercedes Damrotowski, coming to us from Nebraska. And the one that I'm excited about coming up there is me versus Webster Tarpley. And Webster Tarpley represents a certain kind of leftist intellectual that, as a libertarian, would be very, very fun to debate again. One of my most popular videos on YouTube is from 2000, what was it, 11 or 11 or 12? Wow, how the time flies. Uh, let's see, I was doing my TV show in 2011. And then got canceled. And it was Bilderberg 2011 or 2012. First time I, I saw Alex Jones. It was, it's, the, it's the only time I think I've, I've seen Alex Jones in person. And uh, I sat down to interview Webster Tarpley. And I really thought it was just going to be a, a pretty simple, friendly interview. 
but I, I and I, I didn't even think of it as a debate. I, I if I recall, he spoke about you know eighty percent of the time. But the kind of questions that I asked uh, really put him on the spot in such a way that most people called it a debate. So it's time for a real follow-up debate on this. And uh, if you want to help contribute to that, please check that out. I tweeted at Webster Tarpley. If you want to tweet at him to get him engaged, if you want to throw down a little money, one of the cool ways that Make Them Debate works is that you can sponsor a debate and they just hold your card info and they don't charge you until the debate happens. So pretty cool way uh, to make debates happen. Pretty cool mechanism of bringing people together. I really love it. So far, we've had good success with this. So one more big promo. I got to get out of the way because I want to recruit you. I need, I'm, I'm, oh, I should say the, we are waiting for the Freedom Factory to get delivered. And it should, yes, eight weeks was last Wednesday. I know y'all are, patiently waiting and disappointed that we don't have a proper studio from which to do Adam versus the man every day, but it's coming. It's coming. Fingers crossed. Waiting for an email from the manufacturing company, premier buildings.us. And except for this delay in the extended timeline, working with them so far has been amazing. I've seen uh, the building that they made for our friends, uh, Peter and Helen Yapel, and uh, the quality is pretty good. I mean, it's about, about what you'd expect. It's a very sturdy building. It's uh, rated for all the codes and weatherproofing and blah, 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 blah. Uh, really looking forward to having having that plan, the build out for it. And we should be able to get it done in, uh, in a long weekend of manual labor. But um, one of the things that I, I, I'm mentioning that for, aside from the fact that it's a sponsorship opportunity, uh, this building is being financed, and if you, it's going to cost us. And it's really amazing. It's pretty cool what you can do with the financing with these kinds of buildings. Now we're going to be getting uh, another one for a house that uh, Sam and I are excited to be putting together before it gets cold this winter. Uh, as soon as the Freedom Factory building gets here, we'll be putting in the order for the Love Shack cabin, as as she likes to call it, and then uh, hopefully. When we have, we'll have, we'll have all these beautiful matching buildings, but this freedom factory one, very cool. Uh, it's, a, it was only $150 down for a 10 foot wide building. And with this one, it comes out to $324 a month. And if anybody wants to sponsor this, we can call the studio, whatever you want. That's right. Naming rights up for grab. All right. Comment Jim freedom wants to put up here, Joseph Clement. How to sponsor. Send me an email. We'll figure it out. There, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to give us money. You can make, uh, you, we can sign up for recurring payments. You can make it a lump sum. But thank you. Hey, hey, great question. And of course, for the general audience, best way to sponsor is Patreon. Patreon.com slash Adam versus the man. But yes, thank you very much for asking. We'd love to have a specific sponsor for the Freedom Factory building and our studio there. So send me an email. Adam at thefreedomline.com. I'm so easy to get a hold of. Or message me on Twitter, whatever. We'll figure it out. Make it as easy for you as possible. Uh, we're going to have a loft bedroom in this building. It's really cool. And if you go to premierbuildings.us, and by the way, the thing about the delay, you know, COVID. Eh. Eh. Okay, you know, and, and they're very fortunate that as a manufacturing business, they're allowed to stay open at all. The thing is, there are a lot, there's a huge, huge, am I doing it right? Huge demand for these prefab buildings right now. And I, I'm not, I'm not super up on the terminology, I suppose. I think they, I mean, they call them, oh uh, yeah, then now it sounds like a paid promotion, right? They're, I, I want to say before I promote, you know, this particular company, there, there are a number of different companies that, that, of their competitors in the same genre uh, of businesses. And, uh, you know, you see these on the side of the road when you're just driving down the freeway or in rural areas, you know, little, little highways like the 89 here in Arizona, they'll have these uh, lots of, of the sheds out there, these buildings. And uh, a lot of them are bigger than what most people consider tiny homes today. And a lot of people 
will uh, we'll, we'll get these and turn them into tiny homes or other buildings. And it's uh, I, I think legally they have to call them sheds or, or, or something else. I, I, the ones that are cabin style, I like to call prefab cabins because that sounds nice and romantic. But the the, the secret to this, uh, the sort of or the sort of like unknown thing that that Premier Buildings does that that's so cool. Uh, well, two things. One is that their their financing options are really amazing. So if you wanted to buy a this is and, and I and I'm I'm telling you all this not just because it's an insight into one of the things that we're doing with, with our homestead and gardenia. But you know that I always want to encourage people to live by libertarian values. And, and at very least to me, that means living conscientiously in a way in which you contribute as little as possible to the systems of injustice of the world. And the, the most obvious one is to not pay taxes, uh, duh. But there's a lot of other, you know, lifestyle stuff that goes along with that. And for a lot of us, living off grid is a big part of it. I bought my 11 acres out here in the beautiful mountains of northern Arizona for a mere $13,000. And I got it all outright in my name. And I live, uh, well, I've lived there in uh, an RV trailer. I've lived there in a one-room building, thermal mass that I built myself. Uh, living there now in the campaign bus because it's a lot bigger than that one room building. Although as it gets cold, uh, we might move back into that just because it, in, in the winter it, it needs almost no heating. That's what thermal mass is all about and passive solar. So it's very easy though if you wanted to buy, and I just encourage people, you know, if, if, if you're ready to make the leap to this lifestyle, come out and visit us at the Garden of Freedom. I really want to encourage people to get a sample of this lifestyle, uh, to see, it's, it's not for everybody. Some people don't, you know, some people, some people, uh, can't stand living in proximity to that much dust. Uh, personally, I love it. I don't, I don't mind at all. And, um, what, one of the ways to do it, and a lot of people do it by just getting an RV, you know, get a fully ready to go system. Excuse me. And uh, you can you can basically emplace a little RV trailer, the one that I lived in, that I the uh, Freedom Wagon Studio that you saw me in yesterday. I bought that for four thousand dollars used, uh, but but fully functional. All I really upgraded was the uh, or most of what I upgraded was the aesthetics, making it the Freedom Wagon. But I could have just taken that, and uh, I mean, one fun way. To live off grid, you can do this temporarily. I mean, do this like uh, the modern version of Henry David Thoreau, right? Go get your, uh, your your 10 acres, your 40 acres in the middle of nowhere. Get a little RV like that. Get a vehicle that you can haul water with. So you can, you can go with a water tank into town or to the nearest well and fill it up every now and then. And uh, build yourself an outhouse. So that your uh, your waste your, uh, your you can you can do your solid waste somewhere else or hey if you got forty acres you just dig holes dig a hole in a new spot every day right uh, and you know you can even you know use uh, propane have hot showers hot water in that RV and let your piss and your wastewater drain out to a tree somewhere uh, very easy way to get set up and 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 off grid and uh, just. That's why I mentioned these port or these portable buildings that you can in place. Premierbuildings.us being just one example. So the financing, the practicality, but the other sort of uh, I don't want to say secret, but things that most people don't know about these because when you drive down the freeway and you see all these lots with the sheds, you see little ones and you go, well, a eh, tiny house. The one that we're about to order, 16 feet by 40 feet. It's a pretty big building. We're going to have a loft bedroom, uh, like a, a guest bedroom space, big one bedroom, and, uh, you know, full-size bathroom, kitchen, living, dining, and in and, and that space, I think it's going to be very comfortable. So last promo, uh, and I don't know, what, or I, 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 I don't think I can see Telegram comments, guys, for today's show. You're going to have to send me stuff. Oh, oh. So What's that? Listen here. So many activities. Uh, <laughs> yes thank you cj all right so 
uh, the last thing I'll say is that I'm, I'm hiring. Uh, and I've, I've got a bunch of different projects. And I mean, the main one, the first one I'll start with is, is more of a fundraiser because we have a position filled for uh, Homefront Battle Buddies. I'm, I'm bringing back uh, branding that I use for uh, our peer support group for Iraq Veterans Against the War for vets with PTSD to be able to talk to other vets. And we want to start uh, 501c3 where we can at very least use the garden of freedom to host retreats weekend retreats for veterans to get uh, to get peer counseling and to be able to experiment with cannabis and in, in all its various legal and semi-legal forms here in arizona in a way that you'll never get from a government-sponsored veterans program and i think this is so important because there are i mean you've, you've heard me rant about this before right that that veterans Military veterans are overrepresented in the libertarian movement because so many of us as the trigger pullers, the, the, the actual physical evildoers on behalf of government in, in war are often so repelled by our experience that we, we become libertarians faster than, than people who are just experiencing the normal pain and discomfort of statism. I love going to libertarian events and, and saying, hey, you know, raise your hand if you're a veteran. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you stand up and blow smoke up your butts. But uh, it's, you know, it's worth pointing out. And for a lot of us, and I can tell you at least from my experience, there are a lot of things that make me uncomfortable about the, the VA hospitals and, and government treatment. So we have Stephen McClure signed up to do this, and we are just looking to raise some seed money to file with the IRS and be able to buy enough of Stephen's time so that he can apply for grants and, and make this thing self-sustaining. So again, if you want to contribute all of this stuff, email me, adam at the Uh We want to get an intern for Adam versus the man. And now that we have a little loft bedroom coming in our studio, we have a place for you to stay at the Garden of Freedom. So if you're interested in helping with this production, uh, to helping us take it to the next level, now that we have CJ back in the command center in South Dakota, and we have a studio on the way. We want to take things to the next level. I'd also like to get someone to take charge of the sovereignty project for Gardenia to sell citizenship and passports and build out our website and so many other things like that. We've got someone applying to be a caretaker for the property, but there's always more opportunities for that. And of course, Big Igloo Geodesics, the business that Jim Freedom and I started is just kind of kind of sitting there waiting for someone to pick up the ball and run with it. And I still think it's a good time for that. So if you're interested in any of these endeavors that I've mentioned, let's please uh, send me an email, adam at the And oh yes, uh, CJ is pulling up one of our beautiful aerial shots from Jim's drone at the garden of freedom. And if you want to follow us on Instagram, great website, uh, or excuse me, great, gallery there instagram at the garden of freedom let's get jim and cj up on stage here for a few minutes you guys both ready to appear on camera you can't look any worse than me this morning <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, i got a few comments i can go over uh right off the rip the very first comment of the show was a currency suggestion <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it's funny because they they pre pre they start with another dumb currency <coughs> suggestion, but this one's actually probably a good one. Yeah. <laughs> another dumb currency suggestion, <laughs> Gardenbacks. But you got to say it fast, like Gardenbacks, to play on Greenbacks. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, give it, I'll give it it's the most creative so far. The most creative. That's definitely for sure. I don't think we're going to give it. I don't think we're going to use that. But if 10, 10 most, there. Most creative. Yeah, and if he's so enthusiastic about winning membership in the Bruisers Club, we might just give it to, to whoever that is today because I've seen a lot of good comments from that account. Yeah. Oh, honorary, huh? Well, so, so what's going on with you, producer? Yeah, what's up with – what's? oh, me? Oh, um, I woke up late today and just rolled back over and went to bed. So I watched uh, the – the joint press conference last night and uh but i watched it while watching spike watch the joint press conference so i was watching spike watch the joint press conference so it was 
little more entertaining than just plugging straight into the propaganda. On that note, oh, Joe's right here is with this. Joe is in. Oh, yes, that's right. Thank you, Peter, for the reminder. We should be getting this plug in as well. I, Peter and I, uh, and, and I believe Helen. No, wait, is Helen at work? So, I know Helen, I think, is going to join us as well. Um, we are going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's Phoenix area this Saturday for a Joe Jorgensen rally. And uh, my friend Mark Victor should be speaking there. And we'll, we'll be, uh, if anybody wants to join us, we have a little activism Libertarian Party of Arizona planning meeting at the, uh, the Denny's across the street afterwards. So mark your calendars for oh, Saturday. I Look also, up Joe, I, also Joe heard, I also heard word that afterwards in the, at nighttime, there's a protest going on in Mesa. So what are they protesting this time? Um, I'm not sure specifically. I just heard somebody's going to cover a protest they heard about in Mesa. Uh, YouTuber. Go cover it, so. <laughs> you kind of need something to protest for it to be a protest. Just saying. Right. Well, <laughs> there's there's plenty of options. <laughs> plenty of things yeah. needing protested. All right, CJ, how did I do this morning? Did we cover all of our promos? Oh, yeah. Any critical producer notes? Um. Uh, no, nothing critical. Uh, really weird seeing you in a car today. Um, uh, what is that? Well, okay, so if the if the bus itself is the No Force One Studios, then what is the vehicle? Hmm. Like you know, there's Air Force One. There's also Marine One. So what's the the beast? The beast. The That's beast. what they call the presidential the limo, right? The Beast Studios. That's what this is. <laughs> Coming to you from the beast. All right. So do we do we have anybody who wants to call in this morning? I want to get a, a quick rant out of the way about I got I got kind of a big picture thing forming right okay. now. All right. Well, there's no callers that took the bait and went backstage. Uh -oh. I posted the link when you said to. So Adam, why do so many people it, okay, just to lure the callers in? You can comment anything that you disagree with Adam on, and, and some of you do. But why not call in and have a conversation if you disagree so much, or even if just you, audio. or you even if you're just audio, we can handle that. But why not have the conversation instead of just being in the comments? It's it's really crazy to me. It's another level of the of the censorship to where you know because you're shadow banned, maybe people that are more prone to complain about your content would be watching. So they leave a trollish comment less likely to join. But if we were not being shadow banned and if we were getting the same views that average for other channels, our size, I think we'd have more interactions, more call-ins. I think we'd have, you know, if, if 10 spots on StreamYard can be held, I think we'd have seven of them full right now waiting for callers. If we weren't being, as shadow banned and censored so it it's kind of just that's the conspiracy i have when it comes to callers because you'd think we would at least have you know call, callers if not trolls even where are the trolls yeah. like well, no, C cj you raised a different question here i never really considered before but where are the trolls? what effect does shadow banning have on the quality of your audience or the demographics of your audience i mean i would think generally it should make it more hardcore, you know, and, and again, why I'm so grateful for the producers club is that I know I have a sort of more authentic core group to bounce ideas off of that. I know can't be sort of troll swarm. Yeah. But even in this case, Adam, where are the trolls? Yeah. But, but, but again, it's just like, kind of, you know, like the calm before the storm, where are the trolls? Where are, where I mean, a but does it of change? People are asking what's the number. I just posted does the it link change? again. There it is. All right, it, all right, it, Adam. Real quick, last question: Does it change your perspective on the show if, let's say, a hundred people were watching you that just disagree with you, or a hundred people that were watching you just to agree with you? Right. No, and and that distortion can can. I mean, one more way they can screw with your head, right? You had me watch the social dilemma, so I'm all. 
in a different world when it comes to that. Okay, so you were so CJ what just yesterday you, you saw the social few, dilemma a few days ago the weekend, yeah. Yeah, so again, I, I don't mind plugging this documentary one more time. Uh definitely shadow ban. Thank you. Yeah, King Yeti. But this uh like I, I, I hate this having to use this phrase, but I, you know, I got it from Ernie Hancock. He says, nothing on the internet is real. Yeah. And you go, Oh shit. Fuck. And it's, it's obvious exaggeration, <laughs> but in a sense, it's it, what's the internet, the internet, just this, this data, this, this, this thing that some authority is allowing you to see that, that, that is a, a pass through for information that comes to you on a digital screen and through speakers. Mm-hmm. Nothing on the internet is real. And it, it I, I, it's just, it's, a, it's something that is beyond the capacity of the human brain to deal with naturally because it is, it is such an unnatural phenomena. And our, our little monkey brains have to adapt to now being able to access the world and see the world primarily through this distorted hive mind vision of the internet. Yeah, yeah it's scary. And it's, it's like, like they're not just selling your attention. They're selling... Like even Facebook directly, like, and this was one of the points in the social network or the social dilemma is that, uh, by the way, the social network, also a good movie as an expose on the you know origins of Facebook. Although yeah. I think it's missing the big CIA, FBI, <laughs> possible connection backstory there and, and, and potential who knows what happened with MySpace. Yeah. But uh, they're not just selling your attention. They have taken the manipulation of advertising to a whole new level where they're, they're, they're selling the manipulation of your behavior and your understanding and your view of the world. And that, that is, that is a, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's a big part of what we're up against. Motherfuckers buckle up. This is that welcome to 2020 until we overcome this. Like I, I and I think we can evolve past it. I don't know. Maybe we'll upload our, brains all the robots first but i think we're going to overcome this sort of period of human history of the internet being as it is all right guys get off the screen for a second we're going to take some callers before we get to lynn albrecht we have just 25 minutes here and i want to get one big picture rant out of the way jim unless you have no no critical comments all right so we are coming to a point with covid19 the coronavirus crisis where those of us who have been following things the whole time and going, when is the rest of the world going to catch up? When are going to people see this for the racket that we saw it as the whole time? Or are they going to see it as a racket, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of scary sitting here as a libertarian going, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Am I going to sit here and say, I told you so until we're all dead? Like, is, this, is that the new normal? Is it new normal libertarian sitting in the corner being right about everything as everything goes horrifically wrong because people aren't listening to us? No, that and and you know what? Today, I am actually more optimistic than I have been throughout the course of this crisis because I've been asking and I've I've been very cautious in my longer midterm predictions about where this is going. I've been asking, is this, is this a warm up? Right? Our governments around the world simply creating a template for a new kind of war or racket. And and even then, you know, I want to stay optimistic, right? Like just staying true to my larger observations of reality in human history of of, of violence being on the decline and uh, that right now we're living in the most peaceful times in human history, citing Professor Pinker on that, of course, that it's, it's nice that the worst that governments of the world can get away with is a overblown virus hoax as opposed to a world war. And maybe you can measure the deadliness on the same scale when you, when you add in all of the costs of the cure being worse than the disease of the suicide and the drug overdoses and the mental health issues and, and, and the economic desperation and the domestic violence and the child abuse and the sex trafficking and everything 
that has been exacerbated under or as a result of government's responses to this virus that is less deadly than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis or testifying against Hillary Clinton. Uh, and, and, and as I must remind people, I am not now, nor have I ever been suicidal. And a, as we are able to come to this, we also see an unprecedented, I don't want to say unprecedented, maybe that's not the right word, but a, a unique spike, certainly, and, and a new nature of censorship happening around this coronavirus. And, and I, I like calling it the Karen of virus because it's really just turning everybody into the Karen they always wanted to be, right? And, and oh man, is it so revealing? Because this is now the excuse for people to do so many things. You wanted, you wanted to add $9 trillion in liquidity. You wanted to claim more wealth and power for your sponsors. You wanted to rip people off in a certain way. You wanted to do rent-seeking behavior. You, you wanted to just profiteer from being lazy and taking advantage of the situation. You want to sit at home on welfare. You want to use it as an excuse to do this or do that. Hey, coronavirus has your back. But the narrative that has been built to make us so afraid and responsive and submissive when it comes to lockdowns and restrictions and shutdowns and all of the other government interferences with individual rights using the coronavirus as the excuse, it has required this new wave of censorship. Now, I have been described by my producer as the most censored man on the internet because he, he's a great cheerleader. Adam versus the band. But shadow band, undoubtedly, look at my numbers on Facebook, on YouTube, and you go, yeah, something's not right here. And I don't want to be just speculative. And I, I've had enough, I've had enough cases over my well, geez, how long has it been now? 10, 10 plus years of, of independent media work, of specific things of censorship besides the general susp suspicious manipulations of the numbers that just looks like shadow banning. But even recently, their censorship, and yes, there, as in the big they, them, the, those who won't leave us alone has gotten to a different kind of blatant level of being out of control. And, and I, I don't just mean, you know, run of the mill stuff specifically recently and happening right now around Corona and Ben Swan, our, our friend, former mainstream media, credible Fox news reporter, turned libertarian, anti-establishment, independent journalist, does great work as Ben Swan. at Swan with two N's. And uh, we saw his reporting on the effectiveness of masks being censored. And there's one study that I, I just, you know, is would have, would have ended all of this because a lot of people use, are using science as bullying now. Well, if you don't go along with what I want, you're not listening to the science. Well, the science has been clear from the beginning. You have to separate the junk science, the propaganda science from real science. And yes, if I put a mask on and sneeze in front of you, you're less likely to get the coronavirus if I have it. But in a controlled experiment where you have a control group and an experimental group, prolonged wearing of masks increases viral transmission. Doesn't stop it. Doesn't slow it down is not effective. In fact, it's counterproductive. And now we see, okay, so, so this, the, the thing about the, the censorship, just from my part, from, from my recent experience, it was just a few weeks ago, I did a video on YouTube talking about the false positive Corona tests. That, and and I, was, I was commenting simply on two mainstream media articles. One was was I think it was NBC News, Massachusetts, saying that there, there they had the, the, the state health department had busted uh, a laboratory for reporting 400 false positives. 
And then the UK, Boris Johnson announcing the moonshot project that they were going to regularly test every citizen. Well, if you regular, regularly test every citizen with a type of coronavirus test that has a consistent false positive rate, and you say we have to keep this going until it gets to zero, you'll never get there. What else does this remind you of? Oh, yeah, the global war of terror, where I can tell you from my experience in Iraq with the Marine Corps, we made more enemies. We made enemies faster than we could kill them because the war was designed not to be won, but to be sustained. Remember back to March when they were first rolling all of this out? I mean, let's let's go back in the timeline. Oh, I'm sorry, for the censorship. I don't want to talk. If I'm talking about censorship, I'm not talking about the important stuff, but it's worth pointing out what message is being suppressed. For talking about false positives, I was banned from YouTube for streaming and posting for a week. But if you go back, I mean, you'll go, go back just to, to late last year, you go back to January, February this year, you see what was happening in China. And you could speculate, was this a, a virus built in a lab? What was this uh, from a lab in the U.S. to a lab to China to back? I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. There's so much misdirection. You can waste so much time. But where was this virus first? A big public thing, China. Do you remember what they were using to scare us? People dropping dead in the streets. That's what they were trying to tell you was going to happen in America if we didn't submit to everything that our government wanted us to do. Remember the scary pictures from China? They said they were building emergency hospitals. They were overwhelmed. Piles, piles, piles of dead bodies. And then miraculously, suddenly in China, the new infection rate dropped to zero. And you go, maybe, maybe, just maybe we shouldn't trust the Communist Party of China. I don't know. And if you look at the manipulation, how this spread, the coronaphobia crisis, the Chinese propaganda was behind a lot of it. Italy, Spain, the countries that were hardest hit after China were the ones following their model of lockdowns because they said the lockdowns worked. Now, remember, it was around all it was around this time that we got the study from the Imperial College of London. What an ironically apt name for the institution, which said that there was going to be an estimated 500,000 deaths in the UK and 2.2 million in the United States if we did nothing. Now, it would be one thing if the propagandists could now claim, well, if it wasn't for the lockdown, the shutdowns, and the mask mand mandates, then, oh, yes, we would have had those numbers. But no, 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 no. Look at the science now. Not only from the external consequences, the side effects, as I mentioned, suicides, opioid overdoses, drug issues, mental health issues, Lack of access to medical care, nutrition, health, et cetera, et cetera. All of these, not even including that. The cure has been worse than the disease. And now we have a new study. Uh, there's always a new study. But the now accepted science is saying that herd immunity or a slow protective development of herd immunity, protecting the vulnerable as we, as I, as generally as libertarians, as people who are common sense advocated from the beginning, would have saved lives. But how many? I mean, again, let's just put this in perspective because we got the numbers from the CDC when it was at just under 200,000 200, deaths total. And don't forget, my favorite story uh, of the, the whole coronaphobia crisis was that there was, there was that guy who died because he, he was skydiving and his parachute failed to open. And then he died of coronavirus right before he hit the ground. And boom, they had to count him as another coronavirus death. But the CDC even had to come out and admit that of those roughly 200,000 deaths, only 6% could be said to be due to coronavirus only. And that the rest were due to at least other causes 
other coexisting conditions, comorbidities. Now, I don't want to simplify this and say, well, you can only count then those 6%, roughly 12,000 deaths, because it is a contributing factor to the rest. You know, and I mean, it, it, it's killing people who are about to die and it kills them early. Yeah, it's, it's a contributing factor. I don't mean to discount the, 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 the relative health threat of all of that. But then you compare it to the flu and you go back to those of us who from the beginning were saying, yeah, it's a funky off-season flu at worst. How much, do you, how much do you freak out about the flu? Zero? Okay, well, make sure you freak out twice as much about the coronavirus if it's twice as deadly because that's what it looks like. And, and, and being generous now. Being generous. It's a funky off-season flu that could be two or three times as deadly as a regular seasonal flu with some long-term side effects that are being way overblown. And they're scaring us with bullshit now. Your balls might explode as a side effect of corona. I'm, I'm only slightly paraphrasing from a headline that we covered about a month ago where one guy in the United States could have been complete coincidence. They didn't connect it to corona had some testicular swelling issue. Oh, Corona may cause this. Corona may cause this. Corona may cause that. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. And we see that this is not just a singular conspiracy. It's too much for that. It is a conspiracy of conspiracies from the Communist Party of China to the Communist Party in the U.S. And I don't mean the one by that name. I mean the duopoly where we have red flavor communism or blue flavor communism. And the American people get to choose their master every four years. This conspiracy, this excuse, this template of a virus that is is, is truly a, a normal, regular phenomenon uh, within the global human petri dish is an excuse for the largest concentration of wealth and power that has ever occurred in human history now. When you look at how much billionaires have gained in wealth over the last six months, it's literally fucking insane. I don't know how else to describe this. Now, I don't, I don't pretend to have the whole narrative. There's a lot more to this story than I can summarize like this. But when the general public is waking up as fast as it is, faster than I anticipated, I am more optimistic than ever before. I've been I've been uncertain. You know, where is this going? What is the curve? Are we gonna are we gonna flatten the curve of tyranny? Or is this COVID-1984 gonna take off into some dystopic future? But I don't see it happening that way anymore. Because I look back at, at, at the beginning of my experience with this thing. And again, so many I told you so's, but I'm I'm I, I will repeat because I'm proud of the fact that on my birthday, February 1st this year. I did a podcast called The Coronavirus Hoax, and Ron Paul, one month later to the day, March 1st, did a column by the same name. We saw this coming, and yet I fell for it. For a little while there, I fell for it. I thought I had it. And I was lucky. I got a test. See, I found out just a couple weeks later. I did a little blood prick test at home that you couldn't get. Thanks to the uh, the FDA, this one was shut down. No, you have to go to the government approved false positive. Wait for two weeks to get a result version of this test. This is the technology we have. It should be as easy as this. You get a little needle prick at home. You put it on a test paper. You put a little saline on. Boom. And I was negative for the virus and for the antibodies. And I kind of wanted to get it out of the way. I, I wished I'd had it and said, okay, I don't have to worry about it now. But. I, just another thing, the fear and the uncertainty. Could you get it again? If you had it, could you get, does your immunity wear off? The fact that we don't know. It, don't forget, Donald Trump ordered the CDC to conduct its deliberations in private. We don't need government to run healthcare anything. We need government to get the fuck out of the way of science because we would have answers to these questions right now. We would clearly know the best way to deal with this. We would have better tests out there. We would have better answers. We probably have complete solutions to this thing by now. But I fell for it. For a week, I was like, oh, I got the sniffles. Maybe it's the Rona. Funky flu, right? I, I, I genuinely thought I had it for a minute there. And, and I say this out of out of a sort of humility to say that despite despite having the luxury that I have of 
putting so many hours of my head into the news every day, I fell for it. And it took me a while to put it in perspective and to understand everything, to catch up, to deconstruct the propaganda. A lot, as Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is just putting on its shoes. And this is the truth now. This is the narrative. This is what we see. The best case scenario for the defenders of government is that they took what was a natural phenomenon in the human health experience and used it as an excuse to rip us all off. If you're not one of the profiteers from the coronaphobia crisis, you're a victim. If you don't understand how fiat currency works, how creating money steals value through inflation, through the inflation of the monetary supply, devaluing the currency, the value of the dollar, the purchasing power of the dollar, the savings of every American, everybody who's, who's using that currency, then it might not be obvious to you. But even if that part's not obvious now, it should be undeniable what a hoax this has been. And because it's so obvious and humanity is so awake to this now, faster than, at least a little bit faster than I had anticipated. I'm more optimistic than ever before that people will see this. And we're not going to let these fuckers get away with it again. All right. I believe we have a few minutes now before we get to uh, to Lynn Ulbricht. Let's see. It is. Oh, we have time for, for one caller. I don't know. Do we have a caller lined up or should we just... Oh. Take comments and, and wait for Len. All right. Oh, what's going on? Here? Hey, Hello. hey, welcome to the program. Hey, what's up, good to be here. Who is this? I'm Nerd Revolution Radio. You can call me. You can call me Phoenix. <laughs> All right, welcome, Phoenix. Hey, it's good to be here. I'm honored to be here, actually. Uh, well, I didn't really have much of a call other than uh, I would say uh, I think what you're doing and all of these. You know, it's it is a patience game, a patient game that you got to play. Because, I mean, I've debated people who are calling themselves libertarian socialists now, and it kind of turns my head a little upside down to wonder what, <laughs> how does that work? And have you ever like, I mean, you know, but one of my, I guess here's here's a question as a libertarian I got for you: uh, How would we solve plumbing? Like, how does that? If you were to take property taxes away, which I'm all about. How would you solve that? How, how does that go? It, like, where would you steer me to learn about that? that All right, Bean, so you raised two big issues, if I may respond first. Absolutely. Because libertarian socialism uh, or, or socialist libertarian, the, the only problem I have with that really is in the semantics of it because it's, it's, it's bad messaging. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'll just challenge you with this and we can move on. But if you think about socialism and its definition is an economic system based on communal ownership of property, right? Yeah. That's a marriage. That's a family. Mm -hmm. and, and you cannot deny from that, you know, hard nosed economic analysis that there are micro socialist systems that are voluntary Correct. and not only extremely effective, but essential to humanity. And so we might say in the bigger sense that because they're voluntary, they're capitalist that mm -hmm. they're based on the umbrella economic system of an economic system based on ownership of the means of production as capitalism is, is, is dictionary defined. Um, so it's, it's just kind of silly to point out that within what, what we advocate as libertarians is voluntarism is capitalism in the bigger picture that yes, you can create micro systems of whatever you want under, right. Under a voluntary society, you could have, a socialist commune or a communist commune or a nudist yeah. commune. Well, or wasn't a it that the commune and, you know, there was a study done. There wasn't there a study done of like the monkey sphere. Like they'll say you like, they even call it in sales. I think your sphere of influence within 200 people, you're pretty much communism kind of can work. Cause you'd be like, nah, man, I gotcha. No, you gotcha. And then outside of that is where the free market trade is kind of effective. Is that, is that That's what you're, you're kind of talking well, about or? A, a little no, uh, that's that's real. That's a related idea, but it's not what I'm talking about. What I'm okay. talking about is the delineation between whether or not it's voluntary. Mm. So what you're talking about is a specific reputation function uh, in, in in a practical economic application 
where you can look at that that effect and at what scale it works. That's going to change with technology, you know, reputations, keeping track, uh, being able to you know hold someone accountable and and give them a, a real sort of reputation score in a voluntary system. Uh, that's a positive thing. We say reputation score, you think China dystopian. It's a scary thing, but really, it's just holding people accountable in a proper way. And actually, a great example of that 200 number failing already. Airbnb. There are more than 200 people on Airbnb. You get yeah. a trusted rating as a, a host or a tenant. It's it's good beyond 200 people because the technology makes it so. But now to your 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 other question of uh, how do you make plumbing work? Yeah, is, you know, it could be translated right. There are a lot of similar questions. Like, I mean, that's it's kind of like. Know. My roads. Yes, about, I know, I know, I know. It totally about, goes. What about my roads? The water? What, what about, about the water? Plumbing? Well, because so, uh, yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> so you 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 can ask that question. It's it's not an unfair question to ask. To say, look, we have this infrastructure today that is based around and really dependent upon the coercive systems of government, right? However, the ethics hold true. And that is the core of the libertarian answer. So given that we don't have a whole lot of time to deconstruct the whole issue of, of yeah. plumbing and, and sewage infrastructure, I'll just say a couple of things very quickly. One is the overview that applies to all of these challenges of infrastructure is that if, if you're, well, no matter what the question is, we will always be able to do a better job peacefully, voluntarily, cooperatively than violently and coercively as we do today in these systems and we kind of take it for granted living on grid water electricity you know yeah. these kinds of things being run by government and so in, in how we extract ourselves from the systems that becomes an extremely complicated question which i think localization as the general overall simple direction answer is, is the only an effective way to deal with it but there are so many opportunities so many other ways so many things outside the box and for me, living off grid when it comes to water, I mean, I don't even have that option. And there's so many alternatives. It seems silly when you go, well, Adam, shit, you've screwed up so bad. You've been there four years. You still have to haul water in a tank. And it's like, I'm not contributing to children dying by drone strikes, though. I think it's worth <laughs> a little extra effort on my part. I think society could put in a little fucking thought into these issues and say, well, gee, is, is the cost worth the, the, the benefit when it comes to, you know, oh, well, I've got government built roads. No, I'd, I'd rather, you know, drive on dirt trails than, than put up with the evils of government. We'll fucking yeah. figure something out peacefully. Yeah. You know, so there, there really is no excuse. But in terms of water, it, the options are, are, and even with like, hey, if it wasn't for government, you know, we'd all have self flying cars by now, right? Like, I am you know, an advocate for flying vehicles and <laughs> fear is what holds us back to <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, so, well, fear. And if we had, uh, I mean, it, it, I believe we already have the technology, excuse me, where if, if we allowed it to be fully properly implemented and unleashed, you would by now have a kind of self flying car that just goes over the roads and still follows yeah. the road tracks. And, can be proven to have a way safer record than current land-based cars. <sighs> Luckily for water, you, I already water. have an I already have a patent idea on that, so <laughs> you can't take that idea. So just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, no ownership of ideas. I know, but, we, right? uh, uh. but you know, we we've been looking. There's a machine now that you can plug in and just run by solar that sucks moisture out of the air. Uh, by by the uh, the humidity in the air, um, like so. Like if you look at this problem, like well, what do we do about water and sewage without government? It's sort of yeah. like, and I'll quote yeah. Molyneux here because Molyneux has a great example about slavery. Right? Molyneux says when people were debating slavery in America, there were people going, "Who will pick the cotton?" And there was yeah. nobody. Oh, yeah. Going, yeah, nobody was going. Well, we'll have these giant metal machines running on dinosaur juice that will pick the cotton for us and poop out T-shirts. You know, it was just, <laughs> but who will pick the cotton without slaves? And it's True. the same thing. It's like, well, with there's so many things even, and the science is accelerating so fast now. 
Yeah. I mean, I can tell, like, I could just tell you, well, at some, like right now I can, I can show you the technology Yeah. That, that, that will put it on a reasonable timeline by which every human being on earth could have a little device in their home that pulls more than enough water out of the sky for them to, to live off more than comfortably and takes all their shit and, and, and piss and gray water and, you know, incinerates it or, or sends it, you know, whatever, perfectly recycled, uh, it recycles it into some plant or system, you know, like there's, there's just so many things. All right, let's see. We have yeah. Lynn Albright back stage Phoenix. We got to go. We got a great. Appreciate it so up. much so, guys. Thank you so much for the call. Absolutely, Adam. Peace out brother. All right. Let's get Lynn up here. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is none other than Lynn Ulbricht. It is a uh, it is a great honor to have her on again, and I, I'll I'll just start by saying that I came up with a nickname for Lynn, and <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't think it stuck, but I stand by it, and it really should have the patron the patron saint of activist mothers. What what Lynn has done <laughs> as the mother of Ross Ulbricht uh, in in becoming an activist herself. It's just, it's, it's, it, it, for those who don't know, Ross Ulbricht is serving two consecutive life sentences for the alleged creation of the Silver Road and has been through so much over, I mean, I don't even know how long. I guess I, in order for me to put it on my own timeline, I'd have to think back to 2011 when I myself was spending all my $5 Bitcoins on the Silk Road that I wish I could now be donating to Ross's legal defense instead at what, you know, $10,000 a pop. Uh, but what Ross Ulbricht did, and I'll say one more thing to set, to set him up here. Uh, someone, in, in, in one of the government agents in, in, involved in the setup of Ross um, tried to spin this into a, a murder mystery. And Lynn's retort to that was the real murder mystery is here when Ross Ulbricht was providing a way for people to get medicine to children with CBD who needed CBD to prevent seizure disorder and they couldn't get it legally any other way. Why would government agents want to take that away? How many people have died? And it might not be that many around the margins, but certainly a huge quality of life reduction has resulted from the shutting down of the Silk Road, this beautiful mechanism that existed for people to be able to sell illegal drugs anonymously in a way where they were held accountable to their reputation in a proper market setting. And the story of the railroading of Ross Ulbricht is one of the history books. And to know that, that Lynn Ulbricht, his mother, has done everything she has for him since then is just, it, it gives me so much faith in humanity. And as someone who's been to jail and had my family behind me, myself as an activist, uh, I mean, I can't tell you what it's got. I mean, I, I, even for me, it's 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 still it's hard to fathom for someone in Ross's situation who's going four gray walls. This might be the rest of my life, but I got my mom fighting for me on the outside. What a difference that would make to just have four gray walls and and nobody fighting for you like Lynn is. Lynn, it, it's I, I hope that that it does justice. If there's anything I've, I've missed in the introduction, please let me know. Um, I'd I'd like to to give you the platform for an hour and hope that at least somewhere in here we can get a get get caught up on ross's current situation and what people can do to help yeah um well thank you so much it's a great intro um can you hear me okay adam lima charlie thank you you can hear me um and uh i want to say i have quoted your title of me proudly well you know the patron saint of uh activist mothers and uh you know so I have, I have held on to that. I think you gave that to me in an Arcapulco one year, but, um, and also as far as the early Bitcoins, you know, I asked Ross, I said, he was telling me all about it. He was so excited. I mean, this is before, you know, everything happened. And I said, so should I get some? And he goes, no mom, it's too volatile. And I'm nah. like, okay, that was the worst financial advice I've ever gotten. That was probably like 50 cents. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you. Yeah. It's been, a, you know, a long, Ross just started his eighth year in prison on October 1st. Oh, so he yeah. just is go now going into his eighth year. And um, <laughs> since March, because of COVID uh, and then the riots, he's been in a, metal box essentially um 22 hours a day 
with a two hour break. And then with the riots, they locked it down for 24 hours a day for almost a month. So, and he's fed through a slot in the door. You know, this is a person who's never inflicted any kind of bodily harm, violence, anything at all on anyone. And uh, so, yeah. And now just lately, thankfully, he gets out one hour a week. So maybe hopefully you'll get some uh, vitamin D and yeah. um, some break and then uh, is more out of his, his box. But it's been a long, tough road in general. Prisons no cakewalk, as you know. And uh, so, yeah. And I just keep, I just cannot rest until he's out of there, you know, and that he can meet you and so many people and just celebrate being free and, uh, and work for that and work for criminal justice reform and, and really be someone who can be a force for good in the world. And um, so, yeah, so I, I can keep, keep on keeping on, you know, there's not, you know, when you're a mom or a parent or, or a relative, I mean, many people have their siblings fighting for them, you know, people who care about you, they love you. It's really hard to just go, ah, oh, well, I'll just get on with my life. I'll pursue my bliss. Big deal. I can't, not that I don't have good moments and not that I don't have fun and, and try to enjoy things. I mean, and Ross wants me to keeps you stronger. But that's different from, I just keep my eye on that prize of, of Ross being out. So, yeah. And I've had so much help, by the way, I want to say from you, from other uh, Liberty lovers, from people in the uh, crypto space. I mean, to have just really walked beside us and made it possible for me to be, be still at it. You know, it's, it's not easy to do alone and I don't feel alone. I feel like I have real friends and um, that's been the silver lining and um, it's been really good, you know, wonderful to have that. Well, I, I appreciate the nod there to my time, oh, yeah. but I did four months and mm -hmm. it was, I mean, I, I, as I said earlier in the show today, it's not even the same. It's, it's, it's a, t when you go to jail or prison and you know, you can you can make tick marks on the wall, and eventually it's going to be over. It's not the same experience as you make tick mark tick marks on the wall, and you don't know if you're going to die in that box. Mm -hmm. I, like even even as pe people look at me and go, "Oh well, Adam, yeah, you got to be able to sympathize, right? You did time as an activist, and I, I did two months in solitary, and even that wasn't as bad as the." specific conditions that Ross is experiencing right now. And this is a, a whole other crazy case in which, I, I mean, I, I hate to, to, to in any way diminish our, our actual love and appreciation for Ross and, and for you, but there's got to be a bigger public self-interest motivation here, people. Like, you see this happen, you know. So may, maybe before we get into his legal situation, Lynn, for people who aren't familiar with the case or, or maybe don't see the, the idea of this as a kind of dangerous precedent, why should the average American be fighting for Ross out of their own self-interest? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I totally agree with that. It's definitely in our self-interest to preserve our freedoms and our constitutional protections. And um, just the fact that a young, nonviolent first-time offender could be given a death sentence, really, a walking death sentence, death in prison sentence, no, no parole, no chance to, you know, you know, he's matured, he's 10 years older now, no, no chance to, um, of any hope for nonviolent uh, actions is not American, it is not uh, in tune with our values whatsoever. It's really weaponizing the criminal justice system against him and thousands and thousands of other people. And, you know, I, I say this to, you know, liberty loving people all the time is that what is a more fundamental violation of your freedom than being put in a metal box? I mean, you know, that's pretty basic. You know, we can talk about, I've lost my freedom with this thing or that thing, or, you know, there's lots of ways we're losing our freedoms, but this is a fundamental basic freedom that you're in a cage and you're going to die in there. And um, everyone should be concerned. 
that kind of draconian sentence puts us all in peril. And the fact that that can happen in this country is alarming. And um, so, yeah, it's not just about Ross. We have a Bill of Rights in our Constitution that was violated in his case over and over again. His fir the First Amendment was violated when the judge said, I know, we know that you started this site for philosophical reasons, admitting that he started it for a philosophy, a voluntary interaction and um, non-aggression principle and the freedom for people to exchange what they wanted as long as it didn't hurt a third party. She's admitting it at sentencing that she knows that's why he did it, not to be a kingpin, not to exploit people, not to hurt people. And yet she, she, so basically she's saying that philosophy is so dangerous and troubling, and those are her words, that I have to make sure you die in a cage, that you can't get out and discuss this philosophy. We live in America. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to have freedom mm -hmm. of speech. We're not supposed to be incarcerated for our lifetime based on our philosophy. That's the First Amendment. The, um, then there's the Fourth Amendment. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court in Ross's case, where um, uh, the government essentially, what was upheld, at, and we're not protected, is that the government, without a warrant, without probable cause, without oversight, in secret, can legally, because of what hasn't been overturned, go into any of our internet traffic, scarf up whatever they want, use it however they want, and no one will know. They can use it to blackmail their enemies. They can use it to pursue enemies. It has, you know, all kinds of relevant information like, you know, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, um, medical records, political persuasions, all kinds of things. And this is a, um, it was based, this kind of loophole it's called the third party doctrine was based on the dial telephone. Well, the dial telephone was about one phone number that you dialed. Now phones are little computers that have all kinds of relevant information and the law has not caught up with our rights. That's the fourth amendment. And in this case, this was, is what happened with Ross. Then there's the uh, sixth amendment, which was written to protect the accused from rogue judges and prosecutors who don't go by what a jury rules but why they, what they think is true. So in this case, the judge took uncharged allegations from the prosecution and uh, one of them being murder, that Ross planned murder for hire, which he's always denied. They have no proof of it. It's all based on anonymous chats. And she used it to justify this draconian sentence. That is, a, and this went all the way to the Supreme Court too. And she, and uh, you know, they punted it. But this is a problem that apparently has been going on in our country for a long time where the um, people who are not charged or are even acquitted are still put in prison for something because a judge decides, no, I don't, I don't care about what the jury says or if a jury said anything, I'm going to do this. Well, this is completely in violation of our Bill of Rights. And then there's the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Um, if this isn't cruel oh, and unusual, goodness. I don't know what is. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was allegedly prevents, uh, not very effective in doing so, apparently. Uh, but but yeah, Lynn, before we get to the, the back to the current situation with this, uh, one of the things you mentioned was the weaponizing of the state. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of us might think of this as a sort of, you know, they, they want to make an example out of him mm -hmm. where it's, you know, get in line or else. If, if you're and you know, we've criminalized, so the government has criminalized so much normal behavior. Mm -hmm. If they don't like you. If you if you challenge authority, you're gonna get you're gonna get in trouble. But that's that's not actually really accurate. And and in the libertarian community, those are the stories that we see. Activists gets taken advantage of, ripped off, used as an excuse for the state to to whatever. But there are a lot of other horror stories that we don't hear about of just random people being victimized by government agents because they have money or something they want. And, and I know, uh, you know, even down to the sick personal level, we've seen cops go after, you know, boyfriends of exes and crazy shit like that and get away with it because they are state agents. And in this case, this was a, a sort of later development in Ross's story. But can you tell us at least briefly the story of the agents involved who were trying to profit from this case? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sure. Um, what's most appalling about them is that the judge wouldn't allow the jury to know about them. <laughs> so here we have these two corrupt agents and it's all laid out in detail on our website where it says the real and untold story. And you can listen to it as a podcast, watch it as a video or um, read it. And it's foot heavily footnoted. It's based on the public record, pretty riveting stuff actually. But in any case, um, these guys, the judge knew, the prosecution of course knew, and of course the defense wanted them to be the jury to know about the fact that there were two corrupt agents who had unfettered access to Silk Road. They could act as various aliases, including Dread Pirate Roberts, which was the, the lead administrator that supposedly Ross was the only one of those. And uh, they could act as Dread Pirate Roberts and do whatever, right, say whatever they me, wanted. Let, yeah, let, let, me, let me go back for people who aren't familiar with this. So I think there's one thing I have to interrupt just to, yeah. to make perfectly yeah, clear. I can give an that. overview if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, no, just, just the thing about the identity that, that that Ross Ulbricht was allegedly operating under the code name as the administrator Dread Pirate Roberts on the website, The Silk Road. And in the course of the investigation, other agents were able to get into that account and post in that name. I'm sorry to have to interrupt, but I really got to no, understand no, mm -hmm. for people who don't know this is that a cop, if they see you doing something they don't like, can then somehow even on Facebook, possibly, and this is way more complicated with the Silk Road, obviously, but they can get into your account and say something in your name and then you be held legally liable for that. That, yep. I mean, the whole, the whole precedent of that should scare everybody. And, and it's, really? it's not just libertarians. It's anybody who refuses to be a victim of the state or an individual officer says, I want what that person has. Oh yeah. Whatever they for, for whatever motivation. And actually after, um, so these people were not allowed to be known to the jury or mentioned at trial yet after the trial, the defense team kept digging because what they do is they pile on so much material that it's not humanly possible to find every needle in that haystack. But over time they did. And it came out that DPR, whoever that person was signed into the silk road, from that account when Ross had been in solitary for seven weeks, there's no way that was Ross. So it's like, well, who was that? You know, it's like, there's so many unanswered questions. And, uh, but in any case, these, these agents, all their emails were never unencrypted. They've always encrypted emails about them. Won't un unencrypt them. There's all the sealed evidence, undisclosed evidence. The government is not interested in revealing the full story with these guys, obviously. And um, so they used a back door through um, a high level admin, Curtis Green, and who was busted and um, got in. They stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from vendors and they had the ability to change chats, all kinds of evidence that was used as evidence, chats, um, uh, in, in on the marketplace, in the forum, all kinds, say anything, do anything, pretty much free reign. And this was not allowed to be known to the jury. And since then, Curtis Green has come out and said, because he's all involved in the, the, the supposed murder for hire that I personally think was a complete setup and con concocted by the agents and that there was no, but other people think there was somebody, he doesn't think it was Ross. Let's just put it that way. Curtis is sure it wasn't Ross. He has said it publicly. He wants to meet him, have him over for dinner. That he and his wife both, he's afraid of these corrupt agents getting out. That's who he's afraid of. And I'm quoting him. He said it in public and he's very supportive of Ross. How many, how many supposed murder victims say this about their supposed would be killer? I mean, he knows it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things that they typically, and apparently it's done a lot. I didn't know this before I got into this whole thing. Um, they'll say murder for hire or whatever it is and not prove it, but it smears the person. It, it prejudices the jury and they're like, Oh, he's really bad, but they never have to prove it. And they never have proven this. And actually there was an indictment in Maryland um, that said it, and they've dismissed that with prejudice. It is no, nowhere in the legal system is there this accusation anymore. So, well, all the Ross's convictions are nonviolent. So the, the agents are in prison. I think one of them actually might be out by now. And the other one's got a couple more years. 
Um, and uh, they have tainted, especially one of them, Sean Bridges, has tainted many cases. And in fact, many of them have been thrown out because of his involvement. Not not Ross's, though. And um, so, yeah. And they and were, those, those are the corrupt agents we know about. Exactly. I think there's at least a, another one. And a lot of people do who got went. In, oh, so that's another thing that happened. So we saw DPR log in after um, Ross was in prison, but also there was a file discovered that proved that someone had gone in there, a high level person, we think it's another corrupt agent and deleted a bunch of relevant information that would have helped Ross. And that was the evidence the jury saw. And then we found this folder that showed all this other stuff, but it was too late. The, the trial was over and we haven't been able to get a new trial. So, there's lots of speculation that there's at least a third agent. And I think that's pretty, I do. I think so. So I, I think there's a lot of money involved, you know, there's a lot of money involved and uh, on Silk Road, there was, you know, it was a, a, a lot of money <laughs> and that attracts all of that stuff. So. And, and, and just as a modern and, and uh, you know, a, a, a new kind of, you know, realm of operations of human behavior even for us to wrap our heads around I, I think it might help to kind of to understand this it's like if, if you get if you get busted with a baggie of weed and you know it was actually well you had two baggies because you were saving some for later well now they're going to hit you with intent to distribute mm. you know and they go and you go oh that's bullshit that's not fair and and it's sort of like well now they'll negotiate down from that and they'll get you to submit to a lesser charge. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sounds unrelated, but now think about that in Ross's realm. Well, you were facilitating drug sales. Well, because it's in the digital realm and all we have to do is fabricate one message and next thing you know, we get to steal $820,000. Let's just tack on murder for hire and then we can at least be sure, you know, we'll, we'll also get this you know, life sentence guaranteed and you'll never threaten us again. I mean, just it, it, it's when when you take these nor these normal, currently normal evil corrupt police practices of trumped up charges and bullying and and exploiting people that they have the opportunity to under color of law, when it moves into this digital realm, it has some scary distortions, and the reality resulting is life in prison. So. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of a, of a retrial. Is is that where the focus of your effort is now? No, but let me just address what you just said, because you made a really good point. Before this trial, um, digital evidence was not considered solid. It's might, way too easy to fake, uh, delete, um, you know, t tamper with and present a whole new thing. You really only need Photoshop if you want to get fancy. You don't need much. And um, like the murder for hire stuff was all anonymous chats. Anybody can put that up, right? So it, digital evidence was not allowed. This judge has made it a precedent that it is. So we are all more in danger because of that, because honestly, what's to stop somebody, prosecutor, whatever, from saying, oh no, this was here, but we'll put it up on the screen. Hey, look, jury, it's on a screen. So it must be real. I mean, that's basically what happened. It's on the screen. You know, everybody's like, okay. All right, got it. It's convincing. And uh, it's easily, easily fabricated. And so it's a dangerous precedent that we all should be concerned about. Um, you said something else that was really good. But I can't remember if I think. Well, it's, it. it's funny <laughs> earlier, just kind of unrelated. I was, you know, you know, quoting Ernie Hancock, <laughs> nothing on the internet is real. But now I would say, especially stuff the government is accusing you of. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's. It, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. And also you mentioned how people and I know people who said they've pled they've pled to things they didn't do, including Curtis Green, because they threatened their family. They threatened yep. them. They said so. Ninety eight percent of people accused of a crime plea. Now, that just knowing that a number, you should, it's obvious some innocent people are going to, to prison. It's just too big a number. And if you do, they tell you, well, if you go to trial, you're going to pay the price. And you do. And you are going to be given a what much worse sentence uh, and punishment if you go. And so most people go, I don't want to take the chance. And so prosecutors threaten them. They bully them and they go, okay, okay, okay. Is this how our justice system should work in the United States? Is this is America? And it's like, no, 
this is um, the prosecutors running the show in these courtrooms. And um, yeah. And if you do go to trial like Ross did, uh, yeah, you get you get terrible results if you don't win. And you're probably not going to win. This deck is stacked against you. I saw that myself with his trial. So this is not good. <laughs> So what's the current push right now? What are you hoping to happen legally to free Roth? Well, we're, we've really exhausted um, the appeals in the court. Uh, you, get, you can't go higher than the Supreme Court. And um, they chose not to address the Fourth and Sixth Amendment violations in the case. And so you can't go back. That's it on the Supreme Court. There is a thing called a habeas petition that we have, but it's been very slowed down by covid and then the other, and that could, might be, it probably won't be a new trial. It could be a resentencing. I, I don't know. It's very hard to win. Doesn't mean we can't, but you're going to try everything. But um, it, statistically, it's very difficult. And um, the other thing is a, a presidential pardon. That mm. can free him. And um, we have wonderful support from so many libertarians, including um Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen and the, you know, uh, chair of the party, Nick Sarwark and the executive director, Dan Fishman, that also, and that the Libertarian Party itself, who, who passed a motion unanimously. And I'm like, oh, the Libertarians did something unanimously. This yeah, is pretty right. cool. Right now. <laughs> and um, yeah, to, we want clemency for Ross Ulbricht. This was two years ago and they've been great. And, um, you know, because Libertarians understand that Ross's motivation, they understand where he's coming from. They know that, you know, of all the garbage that's said about him is garbage and uh, that's negative and, and that he's, you know, this kingpin thug, you know. I mean, hey, kingpins get way less time than Ross. El Chapo got half the sentence that Ross got. This is El Chapo, who's, you know, how many people died because of El Chapo. And yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, Trump has gone on uh, television and said that he he leans libertarian, that he sympathizes with libertarian thought. And I'm just hopeful that someone can let him understand the injustice here. D and Donald that, Trump has said a lot of things. I know. But, you know, <laughs> he's the one that can get he he is the person right now who had can with a signature free Ross. Yeah. No, this puts you in the really unfortunate position of not being able to say anything mean about Cheeto Jesus or cadet bone spurs or uh, any, any of the other nice words we'd apply to Donald Trump. But no, it, it is interesting to think, you know, to be able to, 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 to be in that position to say, could we, could we call Trump? Could we actually get Trump's attention on, on this one case? I mean, has he ever been asked uh, a question about Ross point blank? Um, I've been told he has not a question um, more told about Ross, but um, I'm not really sure um, exactly what, you know, he's absorbed and, and he's pretty busy, but um, I, I'm, I am hopeful. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's such an egregious case and it's so, um, wrong that you know you know look we need to i feel like trump deserves some credit he's he pushed through that first step act and um against the will of his republican colleagues and that first step back to help a lot of people and now there's a second step back we're you know we're slowly trying to reform this hideous situation with the criminal justice system and he's really been he's pardoned people i, I assume he'll pardon more people and, um, you know, I think it's good to give people credit where credit is due. You might not agree with everything, but, you know, he did. And um, I know people personally who benefited from it. And he wanted to, well, what happened with the, with the First Step Act is there's a hideous, horrible uh, law that are, is part of the 1994 crime bill that Joe Biden wrote along with Bill Clinton. And it has something called the Third Strike Act or the Third Strike, Third Strike You're Out thing policy. And what it means is it, it used to be 
that your third strike was life, automatic life. Now, Ross went to, was, before he is where he is now, he was in a very violent prison. It was a step down from the supermax. And he knew a lot of people doing life, including a guy doing life for marijuana in Colorado, but it's marijuana at the federal level in Colorado. And this guy, Tony, he's doing life. I mean, this is really, really bad. But in any case, and, and actually Ross published a picture, it's on our website um, of him with other fellow uh, drug offenders serving life. And um, anyway, uh, it's uh, on our website, freeross.org, which I invite everybody to go to. And I think it's on the about page if you want to pull it up. But in any case, it's a great picture because it shows these people. And one of them, he they were dancing for joy because first step back passed. And um, there should be an about page on there like uh, over a little bit. But anyway, um, first step back passed. Um, so he had already done about 18 years. And the first step back said 25 years instead of life. And then they found out it wasn't retroactive because of pushback in Congress. So that's like saying, so then he's looking at life again. And I'll, but if you, so basically if you did your third strike now, you, you'd be automatic 25 years. But because it was before the first step back, he still has life. It's like saying, well, slavery's bad, so we're gonna end it, but oh, you're still a slave. So sorry, you were a slave before we freed the slave. So you gotta stay one. That's really what it's saying. It's, it's bizarre yeah. and it's terrible. So, but, you know, he, that's not Trump. Trump was trying to get it through, you know, without being, and being retroactive. So, you know, I, I, I feel like he might, he's a heart for that, or at least he sees the justice of it. And um, his son-in-law's, uh, Jared Kushner's father was in prison mm -hmm. uh, and he's a big advocate of criminal justice reform. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, you just got to keep, keep on keeping on. And, well, there's, there's a bigger challenge if it, if it when it comes to appealing to Trump, assuming he is a populist. You have to make it popular to free Ross. Mm -hmm. and this is why the bigger PR war mm -hmm. is still it, it, it might be what is most ultimately relevant. Is it can we make it popular for mm -hmm. President Free Ross? And I, and I hate to suggest this absurd metric of success but if if we had been so successful in telling ross's story and getting the average american to support him that uh donald trump would have thought it was in his best interest for re-election to have pardoned ross or, or or something before the election it would have been done by now but there's been a huge effort to demonize him as well that makes it almost impossible for a president to say, oh yeah, free Ross, that'll make me more popular. I, I, I know we've, we've dealt with some of this behind the scenes, but, uh, and, and I'll just tell the audience on, on that count that there is, um, you know, not just the, aside from the casual entertainment industry effort to take this story and, and make it a sensationalist movie, there is a, truly concerted, deliberate smear campaign against Ross. And maybe it's done. Maybe they think they've got him, you know, blacklisted enough in the, in the, with the public already. But um, what do you think the worst of that has been? Well, um, first, let me say, we have over 350,000 signatures on change.org asking the president to, um, you know, give Ross clemency and commute his sentence. That's a fair amount of people. Three hundred. It's more than that. It's more than three hundred and fifty. And um, we have a lot of leaders who are listed on our site, who have written letters, who have spoken out. These are, you know, somewhat prominent people, and who, you know, may be able to make a good case. Um, yes, he's been demonized in the mainstream media. He's not in the mainstream media much, you know, anymore. It's kind of an old story, and most. I, I'm sure I could go around in any town in the United States and they wouldn't, most people wouldn't even know who Ross is. Some might, you know, one or two might. I don't think it's that much in, in the public view. I mean, there's so much going on right now. <laughs> I don't, but um, no, I, I, you know, having that petition as a PR tool, but as far as the worst, well, I mean, you know, this whole murder for hire. And of course you and I know there was a piece of garbage movie that was being made, uh, it didn't get to air yet, 
because COVID shut down all the film festivals. So uh, I'm out on that deal. But, you know, could. There's a CBS series coming out about the FBI, I guess, to try to save their reputation. I don't know. And it's a whole series. And one of the episodes is about Ross. And I refuse to be in it because I'm like, I've been burned so many times by the mainstream media, distorting it and sensationalizing the story. But I can just imagine what they're going to say. And um, I don't know if anybody watches CBS anymore, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, that's not great. It's a big company and um you know just keep but you gotta just keep going and hoping see i'm hoping to you know connect with people who are close to the president or his or his you know people who are in the criminal justice reform movement who you know sympathize and and there are many of them and they have spoken out um so you just you know what are you going to do you just keep going and and praying and keeping my eye on the prize of Ross's freedom. And if anybody out there knows anyone, you know, that has political connections of any kind, um, please let me know. You can go to freeross.org and in the footer of every page, you can see where to contact me. It's real easy. And, um, you know, any help would be terrific. And of course well, my, you, you and Ernie and, and so many of you know, my good friends in this movement have been, have been great. There's the picture. If you can scroll down a little, see that up, I mean, sorry, not down, up, 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 up a little bit. Just about, well, that's Ron Paul with Ross in the lower picture right here. He brought Ron Paul to state college back when he was in uh, grad school and um, worked in his campaign. And the one on the upper left, if you click it, it's a big um, picture of him with the nonviolent drug offenders that are serving life in, in Florence. There you go. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. Ross on the bottom. Uh, the guy, Tony, who's serving life for marijuana is third from the left standing. The guy, Jay, who's on the far right, is the one that, you know, thought he was getting out because it was, you know, uh, we thought that first step wasn't retroactive. The fellow right below him is Jose, sweetest guy ever. I met him. I've met his sister. I've met many or interacted with many of their families. And, you know, these are people, they're not violent, you know. And the guy, Sean, up on the upper left, he got caught with user amounts of heroin. It was his third strike. He's not a dealer. He's got a problem. He's an addict, you know, and they gave him life because it's a third strike. I mean, this this third strike law has put thousands and thousands of people in cages. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And, they, and I'm glad at least that Trump was able to push through the first step back. And it was a struggle, but at least going forward and maybe they'll make it so it's retroactive eventually, um, at least going forward, you know, people won't get life for making a mistake, you know. Like being an addict. Or making a statement. Yes. Or making, having a philosophy. <laughs> well, Ross's wasn't his first third strike, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Lynn, you, know, you can always count on me. Of course, you've got I my number. I, I, I love hearing Absolutely. from you anytime you have something Thank to you. promote. Um, anytime we're, we're doing another round of promotion. Oh, there's one of, yeah, this is Ross's artwork. That's uh, I just went down there. It's in um, Soho. No, that one's in, yeah, that one's in Soho. It's like painted on the a building and Ross did the artwork and then they copied it and painted it on a building in Soho. It's really cool. And there's a, a billboard in Times Square and there's um, another one in Brooklyn Navy Yard around New York stuff. Yeah. So that, I went around New York with the person who financed it and we went around and I got to see them all. It's really neat. And um, so, but no, I know I can, Adam, and I hope to see you in uh, Arizona. Love Arizona. And um, yeah, I've really appreciated your support, Ernie's, all, you know, all our friends. And um, it's been the silver lining of this nightmare, really, to meet all of you people, such good people. Yeah, so. well, as, as much as it is a nightmare and as much as I hate this story, I love that it represents an opportunity to celebrate someone as a real hero. And I think the, the more uh, we can make Ross an icon, uh, the better off humanity is. The more people know his story, the more people know his face, his name. The, mm -hmm. Not only is it more likely for him to be free, but for America and really humanity to, to learn the lessons of his story. So, Lynn, uh, aside from going to freeross.org and, and signing the petition, uh, what can people do to help and, and connect with you? And is there anything else we yeah. need to cover today? 
Um, no, I, I think we covered a lot. Um, I would say, you know, again, if you have any connections politically or any other way that you think would be valuable, please get a hold of me. Of course, we always need um, donations too. And um, really help us on social media. Um, you know, there's still a lot of trolls out there and a lot of misinformation. So if you go to freeross.org and learn a little bit, um, you'll you'll be able to help defend us because sometimes we're, you know, battling these people who are so full of misinformation because they just get it from the mainstream media. And I don't believe anything they say anymore after my exp personal experience. I mean, they just echo each other with a bunch of misinformation. I'm sure you know that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so any of that, any there's a take action page on our website that has some suggestions. But a lot of times, like the guy with the billboard, he just came up with his own idea. So, you know, yeah, I, I'm just me and our family and, and some, you know, steadfast friends and supporters. Very small. People go, hey, you know, how's you get your team? I'm like, my team? Where is my team? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have. Yeah, I do have help, but it's not, not. We're small. Very, very small. We can always use help. So, um, yeah. Um, any of that, just, uh, get in touch with me and, yeah. And, uh, thanks thing. for all your good work, Adam. And, you know, you're keeping the whole subject of Liberty going and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge these days, right? Well, Lynn, I think more than a team, you have a movement behind you as, as well you should in this effort. So thank you for yeah. stepping up and, and truly Absolutely. deserving the title, the patron saint of <laughs> activist mothers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. All right. Uh, I think we're going to have to end the show a little bit early today. It is getting warmer than I anticipated. I don't know if you could tell. I'm getting uncomfortably sweaty in this hoodie. And unless you want me to do the rest of the show with my shirt off, we're going to have to cut it just a little bit early. I know it's like the, the, that, that's the most unusual thing we could possibly do for Adam versus the man, but let's wrap things up at least properly with appreciation for our audience and get comment Jim Freedom on stage here for a few minutes. Jim, I think that was great to get an update from Lynn. I hope that my uh, my rant uh, earlier earlier in the show was was useful and yeah, like, you know, giving people what we have now for the, the longer timeline of COVID. What do you think so far? Uh, oh, switching over to COVID? <laughs> I was thinking. You were what a okay. Well, everybody was really uh, moved and and loved uh, Lynn for that interview. I just wanted to point that out. They wanted to uh, tell her keep fighting. You know, they're with us. They're sending hearts. So hopefully, she sees that uh, there are more people than she might imagine following her and and rooting for her. So um, I haven't heard anything about. Uh, about your Corona block. You did a great job uh, summing everything up when you did do it. That's that's going to be our one clip from the rant, rant on the road uh, Thursday. Can't even say it's Friday. We'll get there. Trust me, we'll get there. Any other unique comments? Any other fun conversation in the audience today? Uh, I'm still scrolling back through. I'm a status is off. He's saying Trump is too law and order to pardon Ross. Police are infallible to him. Yeah. Yeah. So that. How do you work that challenge in, in trying to, you know, yeah. Uh, can, girl, can you, oh, I mean, oh, hold on, it's not, I want to finish addressing that comment for a second because it's not just. If he was really about law and order, then he would be about holding everybody in the law enforcement related to Ross's case accountable. And at very least, Ross's sentence would be reexamined and his, he would be you know, available for a retrial. If you're like, I'm law and order, I want more law and I want more order and I want more due process and I what accountability. But that's not what that is. The problem, there's the the law and order populist persona and there's the i serve the bankers in reality side of trump as well right you know well moose right. girl always right. suggests that everyone write to trump on behalf of ross do you think a massive write into trump would be effective i i think if they get to that critical mass a single one might but you can go ahead and do it yourself right now and i'll bet there are detailed instructions 
at freeross.org. And if you have never been to freeross.org, I'll end early so you can go to freeross.org and at least sign the petition and get on their email list, if not take one of the next steps, like writing a letter to Trump. Word. Although at this point, yeah, I would I would wait. Honestly, write a letter to Trump. Um, if, if we had the resources in the middle of this election season to suddenly make a letter flood happen and that be injected into the election narrative, it'd be worth it. Um, otherwise, I would say wait until we got a lame duck Trump or Trump's on his second term and might be more free. Uh, definitely write a letter to Trump one way or another, but I would say wait until after the election. You know what you could do while you're writing that letter is you could enjoy a fine cigar from cigarfederation.com while you use the promo code ADAM10. There you go. All right. Idea. Well, I guess that's, that's our first piece of good news for the day. You can still enjoy cigars, and we'll be doing Cigars and Sunsets tomorrow. At, well, I think for tomorrow we're going to have to make it 530, but we'll post that all around when, when I figure it out and make it official. Of course, Adam versus the man.com. We are live Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. Pacific time. Excuse me. You can support the show as a Patreon member, as a patron. Excuse me, as a customer on our store at Adam versus the man.com slash store. Or just by showing your appreciation for the message by sharing it and using it to help make the world a better place. And really, that's the most important way. I mean, if I could make it just about that, I'd say fuck the money. You know, let's just get the message out there and put me out of business. I mean, that's 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 the goal. As a libertarian, my goal is to make being a libertarian irrelevant. Anything else we need to say today, Jim or CJ? If not, then there is one thing we have to say every day. Mwah! Peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other. 